Hello everybody, this is the Empirical Audio File. And I just watched a video about the Premiere 10. Could this be the world's best preamp? And I thought it was an interesting video. Because of the fact that it does mention like the <clears throat> Marantz preamp that was built in the 60s that people crave that said sounded so good. But I think Conrad Johnson went and made this preamp so good that it was really very hard to beat. In fact, in today's dollars, if you want to buy a preamp that sounds better than this Conrad Johnson or is of this quality, you're going to have to spend probably close to fifteen to twenty thousand dollars. And I'm just being serious. You are going to have to spend that much to buy anything with the quality that this preamp has into it. And I'll get into that. While combined in a single chassis with common stereo controls, the Premier 10 is in reality two separate all-tube manual preamplifiers sharing only a line cord and a power transformer. That is exactly how this preamp was made. It's like having two preamps in one. Okay, the, the audio circuitry of the Premier 10 consists of a single trial amplifier direct coupled to a trial cathode follower. The low output independence of the cathode follower permits the use of the Premier 10 even in installations with long, highly captive amplifier interconnect cables without attenuation of high frequency information and without softening of transits. That was another characteristic of this preamplifier that a lot of Preamplifiers don't have the capability of doing. There was an another thing is in the Premier 10, each channel has its own discrete regulated DC power supply. These power supplies have been carefully designed to minimum impedance, even at very high frequencies, to prevent the power supplies from degrading music reproduction. Another thing that they put into the Premier 10. And of course, the something that a lot of people don't understand about the Premier 10, the audio circuit of the Premier 10 uses only Conrad Johnson proprietary polystyrene capacitors and the power supply. All capacitors are polypropylene and polystyrene. There are no electrolytic capacitors anywhere in the audio circuits are their DC power supply. The audio circuits and power supplies both use high precision laser trim metal foil resistors. Internal signal path wiring is exclusively of all silver. Now, where are you going to find a preamp that uses all silver wire internally? Input and output connectors are precision machine oxygen free copper and are gold plated. Industrial grade controls have been chosen for their crisp feel and extended life. The volume control is a 23 position switch selecting among 23 pairs of resistors. Never more than a single pair of resistors are inserted into the single bath by this control. Similarly, the balance control is an 11 position switch that is out of the circuit at the center position. So in other words, nothing is going through that volume control as long as it's in the 12 o'clock position. There are no carbon track or conductive plastic resistive elements to degrade the audio signal in this unit. and. Uh, that's something that you can only get in very high-end components. 
Just to give you an idea of the heft of this preamplifier, it weighs 28 pounds, and its dimensions are 16 deep by 19 wide by almost six inches high. And the tube components are four 6GK5 single trial tubes that are in here. And they're all on a floating chassis. And of course, a uh, uh, hum to noise ratio is 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, 94 dB below 2.5 volt output. So that's what you're getting with this preamplifier. And of course, it has less than 0.25% total harmonic distortion at one volt output. So that's pretty, pretty low distortion. In fact, the Premier 10, you'll hear nothing off of big horn speakers. Now, it seems to marry up pretty good with any of my Macintosh equipment that I have. And we have to remember that anytime you get a preamplifier, your front end, whether it's going to be a CD changer or what it what it's going to be, your front end, is going to make all the difference in the world. Like what kind of DAC you're going to have. Uh, and this is an MDA 200 DAC. And what's going to go into that preamplifier? A preamplifier to me should actually stay out of the way. And it's hard to even find preamplifiers today that have all silver wire in it. I know some people make the claim um, silver wire doesn't make a difference, but apparently some manufacturers think it does, and therefore they put the time and trouble to actually build their equipment with silver wire versus just copper wire. Uh, in fact, uh, on another channel, OCD Mikey, he turns around and talks about some of these phono cartridges, you know, that cost $45,000, $55,000, and a million dollars, only using copper wiring inside their phono cartridges. But, uh, and as you know, the Ankegu, I think that's the correct name, Ankegu, um, uses all silver wire in their transformers and everything from audio note. So apparently they think that silver does make a difference. So that's why the manufacturers are making it. And that's like, for example, that audio note amp, even today it's highly desirable because even an old one uh, integrated amp uh, is highly desirable today. And that's exactly what this Premier 10, it's one of those things that they made, that they put time, they put trouble into it, they put time and trouble, engineering, uh, floating chassis, all the stuff that you really don't see in amplifiers or preamplifiers today, where manufacturers, if they are going to do it, they're going to charge you fifteen, twenty thousand dollars dollars for a preamplifier, where you could probably pick up one of these Premier 10s for what, maybe a, a grand or two. If it's in good shape, real good shape, it's probably going to cost you two grand. But you think, well, that's a lot of money. But in reality, no, not for the quality you are getting. This thing is made to last a lifetime. It should last the rest of your lifetime easily. Now, I know some people like to upgrade these with capacitors and stuff. It doesn't really need to be. And when I say this preamp is dead silent, it's dead silent. Along with the DAC, the uh, uh, Conrad Johnson Premier 9, just like the DAC of the Macintosh and just like the everything that's in the front end of here. And that's the thing about horn speakers. You really, really need to have things that are very, very quiet because you got that big, huge horn. And if you're getting any kind of hissing noise or, or anything from the tubes, you're going to hear it. That's all there is to it. That horn is going to be re relentless. It, it's just going to make 
those little things annoying in between the darkness of, of the music. You know, when the music's not playing, it's dead silent. And that's what you may want because that's what brings out the dynamics. That's what brings the noise floor down so you can hear clearly all the little micro details that are in the recording. And of course, all the Premiere equipment is dead silent, even though it's tubes. And a lot of people, I think they get tube equipment and they immediately uh, think to themselves or surmise that, uh, oh, it's a little noisy, but, but you don't hear it when the music is playing. Not so with the Conrad Johnson. It is dead quiet. There is no noise coming from any of the tubes, the amplifier, the, the DAC, the preamp, nothing. It's dead quiet. Even with that big, huge l -Tech horn, you hear nothing. You can put your ear right up to it, and there's literally nothing coming from that speaker. I can't emphasize that enough. There's no reason why we as audiophiles accept anything that has noise coming from the tubes or from its design or from like a phono preamp that has a little... There's no reason to accept quality like that. Not not in not today's audio components or even these components that were made in the 90s. If they're well-made components, they should be dead silent. Dead silent. You should hear nothing. To me, if I go hear noise coming out of the tweeter or if I hear noise coming out of the mid-range, I you know, right away that turns me off of the piece of equipment. So these are components, even as as old as they are, are dead silent. And the complement of tubes they use, I heard the tubes that they use are not really audio quality tubes. They're more uh, TV tubes, someone said. I don't know enough about tubes to tell you uh, the tubes that are using in this preamplifier, which is the, uh, the 6 GK5s. I don't know if they are audio quality tubes. I know they're uh, GE tubes, but I don't know if they're, you know, really made for TVs or if they're audio tubes. But it doesn't make a difference to me. The main thing of it is, is a preamplifier should not be adding anything to the music. It should not be taking anything away from the music. Anything that comes into a preamplifier should only stay the way it is and be sent off to your amplifier. And the amplifier then is the last part of the chain before it goes off to your speakers. That's why, to me, preamplifiers are very hard to evaluate because first you have to know what the front end sounds like. You have to A, B preamps almost to tell, is one coloring the sound, is one not? And how would you know? Really, unless you know what the front end actually sounds like, it's very hard to determine what the preamp is doing. You would only be guessing because you don't know if the front end is doing something to the music to change the sound or to take away from the sound stage because they say everything's in the front end. If the front end has sound stage, it's going to do it in the front end, in your transport and in your DA converter. That is where you're going to get all the magic. If it does not exist in the recording, and if they can't reproduce it, then you're not going to get that high-quality, high-end sound. And that's the problem with a lot of preamps. I've had preamps from Carver, um, not impressed with. You know, the 4000T wasn't impressed with it. It was not, it was a noisy preamplifier. And I think preamplifiers like that, you're going to buy them and you're going to get tired of them after a year or two. And you're going to be looking for the door to get rid of it. Uh, stay away from stuff like that. Get your higher quality ones of your Mark Levinson, your Jeff Rowland, your, uh, even your Macintosh, if, if that's something you, looking for your Conrad Johnson, because the better your equipment is here in the front end, 
for your phono and your reproducing of CDs or even your streamer. The better that is, the more the preamp should get out of its way and let you hear it. And that's exactly what this Conrad Johnson does. I think because you don't want a preamp to hold anything back. That's another thing. If you get a preamp and you don't know, and you listen to some of these reviewers and they're telling you about it, you don't know if that preamp is holding any information back. You know, that could be something sonically that you're looking forward to hearing. You don't know it. Or is it changing that signal in a way to color or change the sound so it makes your preamp sound better? You know what I mean? It's just something that preamps should not do that. They should only be a means of you taking a signal, sending it through there without any distortion, without adding, without taking away, and just sending it off to your amplifier. That's exactly what this does. I think Conrad Johnson, in my opinion, did shoot themselves in the foot. They made a very excellent preamplifier with excellent parts, in my opinion. And it was very hard to beat because I've listened to preamps in the $15,000 and $20,000 range that I would still rather buy a, this Conrad Johnson, even if I have to get up and adjust the volume control. I would still rather do that than buy some of these uh, expensive preamps they sell out there and waste my money on them. You know, because you can always buy something like this. And I've been running this thing for since the 90s with zero problems. Absolutely none. And it is dead quiet. I'm an audiophile. I'm here to listen to music. I'm listening to, I'd rather pay, let me put it this way. I'd rather pay for quality than I would convenience. I want quality. And this is one thing you can get for a decent price, a very high quality component for a decent price with a little inconvenience. So until next time, this is the Empirical Audio File. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. And until next time, happy listening.